I think that uh, using the word God or, uh, or the attitude of faith toward that which you don't know is, uh, is a cop-out. It's a way of s slapping a label onto something uh, rather than trying to understand it. Or, since we may not, not understand everything, uh, just say there's some things we don't understand. Uh, to invent stories uh, that sound as if they were true or could be true, to pretend that they're true just so that we can have a story, I think is, is unsatisfying and it could even be immoral because it could lead you to uh, mistaken policies, to uh, getting in the way of your best understanding of how the world works, um, to doing things that could that lead to more harm than good. I mean, the concrete example would be treating uh, cancer with some cockamamie uh, herbal or homeopathic formula instead of the best medicine that we have, uh, or justifying uh, <coughs> invasions and murders and sacrifices on the grounds of uh, appeasing some god or carrying out some divine mandate. I think there's nothing but mischief that can come from inventing um, stories for uh, that which we don't understand. There's nothing wrong with saying there's some things we don't understand. Yeah. The issue tonight is to what extent are we still under the shadow of natural selection? We're not concentrating on grand theories, but how far does evolution make its way into everyday life? Evolution is about success in reproduction and survival. So let's start with human reproduction. To what extent are our sexual desires determined by our evolutionary inheritance? Steven Pinker. Well, I don't think people have sex for evolutionary reasons. They're not interested in propagating their genes. If they were, uh, there'd be no such thing as contraception. On the other hand, if you ask the question, why is there sexual desire to begin with? Why do people get pleasure out of sex? I think evolution has everything to do with it. The fact that people would rather have sex than, say, bump foreheads or rub an elbow against a knee surely is related to the fact that sex leads to uh, reproduction, whereas those other activities don't. Uh, more subtly, I think that there are a, no a number of features of sexuality that can be explained on the assumption that it is a, a way of uh, sending genes into the next generation. The fact that uh, people are attracted to other people who look as if they're fertile, who have the right body shape and size, and the right age. The fact that there so are... So is it men attracted to... A, a, from a book, men attracted to a particular sort of women and vice versa? And the difference between the sexes. The, in all societies, male sexuality and female sexuality are not equivalent. Roughly speaking, men uh, have more of a tendency to go for quantity, women for quality. And it's surely no coincidence that a man who has sex with 50 women can have 50 times as many children. A woman who has sex with 50 men is not going to have 50 times as many children. So that biological fact and that behavioral fact uh, presumably are related. And that's an example of how uh, evolutionary theory helps uh, explain some of the patterns of human sexual desire. But in a process that's been called the humanitarian revolution, these brutal, sadistic forms of corporal punishment were abolished. They were abolished within a fairly narrow window centered in the second half of the 18th century. Here we have a timeline from 1650 to 1850 showing uh, a number of major states of the era that abolished uh, cruel ph physical punishments, including the United States with its famous prohibition of cruel and unusual punishment in the Eighth Amendment to the Constitution. Also abolished during this period was the profligate application of the death penalty for non-lethal crimes. 18th century England had 222 capital offenses on the books, including poaching, counterfeiting, robbing a rabbit warren, being in the company of gypsies, and strong evidence of malice in a child 7 to 14 years of age. The death penalty was not just on the law, in the law books, but was exuberantly applied. Uh, Samuel Johnson writes of a seven-year-old girl who was hanged for stealing a petticoat. By 1861, the number of capital crimes had been reduced to four. Likewise, in the United States in the 17th and 18th centuries, the death penalty was prescribed and used for theft, sodomy, bestiality, adultery, witchcraft, concealing birth, slave revolt, and counterfeiting. Here we have a graph that extends from 1650 to the year 2000, showing the percentage of American executions for crimes other than murder. In the colonial and early federal period, a majority of the executions were for non-lethal crimes. In recent years, the only crime other than murder that has been punished by death is conspiracy to commit murder.
The death penalty itself, of course, has been abolished throughout the Western world, except in the United States. This timeline shows that uh, just about every European country has abolished capital punishment. Most of the abolitions took, have taken place in the last 60 years or so. But well before that, European countries lost their taste for executing people. The blue line shows the number of European countries that actually execute people, whether or not they have capital punishment on the books. And you can see that there's been a steady erosion of the application of the death penalty before it was, it was uh, stricken from the law books. Now, the United States is famously an outlier, or I should say that 34 of the 50 states are outliers because uh, 16 have abolished it, a number that uh, has increased by five in just the last decade. But even in the United States, the death penalty is a shadow of its former self. Here we have a graph from 1625 to 2000 showing the number of American executions per capita. The graph shows that the uh, execution rate has plunged. Uh, today, uh, for all its notoriety, the death penalty is applied uh, approximately 45 times a year in a country that has almost 17,000 homicides. Also abolished during the humanitarian revolution were witch hunts, religious persecution, such as burning heretics at the stake, dueling, blood sports, debtors' prisons, and perhaps most famously, slavery. Slavery used to be legal everywhere on earth, as you can see in the number of uh, states that abolished uh, slavery in uh, 1600. But in a process that began in the second half of the 18th century, it was targeted for elimination uh, in country after country, a process that uh, reached its completion in 1980 when the last spot on earth, Mauritania, finally abolished slavery. And so for the first time in history, slavery is now illegal everywhere on earth. Well, I say liberal values should not hinge on the empirical assumption that sexes, races, uh, ethnic groups are biologically indistinguishable. In many cases, they surely are. In some cases, they may not be. I don't believe that men and women are psychologically indistinguishable in every respect. But I don't believe that any policy of how we ought to treat men and women or uh, blacks and whites should depend on um, on the empirical claim that they are or aren't identical. We certainly know that anything you want to measure in any human groups, the overlap is enormous, if not complete. And that gives a, a practical justification for treating individuals as individuals. Namely, you don't really buy very much if you um, use as prior information what group they belong to. Uh, in, in the sense in, you mean, see that in other words, that even if it were to be true, no necessary evidence that it is, that men were better than women at math, you would still have such a huge uh, class of women who were superb at math, far better than I could ever be at math, that you could staff every department in the country uh, exclusively with women if you made that as a social decision. Uh, that's right. That if, if you were to try to um, short-circuit the selection process by saying, let's give a, a few extra points to this sex or that sex uh, because of the statistics, you would gain so little mm -hmm. that you, you, you'd be much better off looking at the individual mm -hmm. um, I mean, in either direction because you can make the same argument for staffing, say, English departments with, with women, women based on the, the greater measured verbal fluency mm -hmm. of, of uh, women. So there is the statistical argument, but there's also the moral argument that it's unfair to the individual. And so if you have a policy of fairness, uh, then it really is a policy of the rights of the individual because you don't want to make it vulnerable to an empirical claim that might be overturned tomorrow. I mean, for all we know, it could be that women on average are biologically better than men at verbal skills or men at spatial, better than women at spatial skills statistically. And you don't want to be in a position of saying, okay, let's go back to gender discrimination. It wasn't right. so bad after all, we right. were wrong. You want to say, well, we were right in treating individuals as individuals. And then as a a uh, scientific question you can ask what's the overlap of the distributions and what are the sources of whatever differences there may be, but you don't compromise this important principle of equality. Uh, militant religions, like other militant ideologies, that, uh, that denigrate the value of an in the life of an individual man, woman, or child, I think are among the most pernicious destructive forces. And the general secularization of the world since the time of the Enlightenment, I believe, is one of the forces that has uh, 
help reduce violence in, in many parts of the world, institutionalized forms of violence like the Inquisition, the Crusades, the wars of religion, that some of the remaining threats do come from idea, religious ideologies that still glorify the, the creed, the faith, the religion over the uh, lives on earth of individual men, women, and children. Yes, most people have the uh, stereotype that science is about uh, inventing gadgets, curing diseases, monitoring the environment, a narrow uh, utilitarian focus on the material world, on, on uh, stuff and uh, bodies. But uh, science is much broader than that. It's really our uh, best attempt to understand uh, the world around us, including the world of other people, including the world of uh, politics and history and economics. I see science as, first of all, being committed to the idea that the world is intelligible, that uh, there are explanations behind phenomena, and also that the search for those explanations is hard, that we are, uh, the human brain by itself is ill-equipped to figure out how the world works. We were, uh, our brains evolved to solve concrete problems like um, finding out which plants are safe to eat or how best to trap an animal. They're not so good left to their own devices at figuring out uh, not only how the material world works, where life came from, but why wars start and stop, what drives the crime rate up, up and down, uh, what's uh, good or bad for the uh, economy or the environment or education. But that science can be applied to these problems and often it delivers surprises that uh, when you explicitly acknowledge that our own common sense is likely to be a source of error, that there are enough psychologists who have characterized a number of bugs in our uh, cognitive software uh, by devising workarounds for those bugs, which I, is what I see science as being in the business of doing. You can often be uh, surprised at the state of the world and surprised at uh, what we can do to move the state of the world in directions that we like. The uh, third influence is uh, one that came late to me in my own career. I think like a lot of scientists, like a lot of academics, I, I believed that what I was doing was, was worthwhile. It kept me off the streets, got, get, got me a paycheck. Uh, I published in journals and, and got all of the uh, usual uh, academic uh, rewards. But it was hearing Richard um, sincerely and uh, in a heartfelt manner uh, expressed the idea that there was something noble about the enterprise of science, that this was part of something that's larger than any of us, something that is uh, noble, that, it, that is moral. Uh, this is something that scientists are not willing to say. It just seems to many of them to be, um, I don't know, corny or, or um, it's not going to get you any grants. It's, not, it's uh, kind of an embarrassing thing to say. But Richard said it in a way that was um, heartfelt and sincere and uh, passionate. And it awakened me, in me the idea that, uh, first of all, this is true, that the pursuit of insight, of explanation, of truth, the humility that comes from testing your ideas, from being prepared to be wrong, from letting the world tell you that you're wrong, from uh, submitting yourself to institutions that allow you to be uh, criticized since no idea belongs to a person, the ideas for the ages, all of the ideals of science as itself a uh, moral system, as a purification of the best that we could strive for, uh, I really uh, owe, to, owe to Richard for uh, being willing to articulate it in a way that most scientists, however much they believe in it, would not be willing to go on record as uh, saying it in so many words. There is a, 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 um, a, a lot to say about political language. Uh, one of them is that the logic of uh, plausible deniability and mutual knowledge and relationship negotiation that drives us to indirect speech uh, in ordinary conversation, like passing the salt, is uh, even more magnified in the political arena because anything concrete that a politician says in terms of policy is bound to offend some sector of the population. Uh, and uh, so the art of uh, a lot of political rhetoric is to say things that are uh, vague enough that there is plausible deniability in terms of some position that will um, tick off a constituency, uh, but that can be interpreted by those who are receptive in a way that's favorable to their interests. 
Uh, and this process pushes politicians to vaguer and vaguer and windier and windier and emptier and emptier rhetoric, uh, like, you know, say, what, what is your platform for running the country? Change. Well, yeah, well yes, but uh, what kind of change? Well, if everyone, it's vague enough that everyone can read into it the kind of change they favor without uh, there being any change in the things that, that are um, aspects of the status quo that they're, ha they're happy with. Now, that's, of course, extremely hypocritical. But on the other hand, it's we, the audience, who are equally hypocritical. Because what happens when a uh, politician actually comes out and says something contentful or substantive? There's a firestorm. Uh, there, the politician will have committed uh, what we all know as a gaffe. Now, of course, the best definition of a gaffe is from Michael Kinsley, namely, a, a gaffe is when a politician says something that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and the, uh, I think the broadcast media and, and many, many of the print media are, are guilty of, uh, of making this worse because their idea of political coverage, when it's not the horse race, it's, is, is just uh, gaffe spotting. Uh, the presidential debates, uh, I think, quite egregiously are covered by the media simply in terms of uh, waiting for one or the other to commit a gaffe, uh, and which then gets endlessly discussed. Um, and uh, to the extent that we allow ourselves to be swayed by so-called gaffes, uh, by the one soundbite, the, uh, you know, when people lose their jobs, they turn to guns and religion. Uh, we're a nation of whiners, and they get the lipstick on a pig, uh, and so on. We're, like it or not, forcing the politicians to give us empty rhetoric. So that's, that's one dimension. Another one, of course, is competitive framing. Uh, whether a tax uh, increase is paying our bills and, and, and not uh, uh, um, beggaring our grandchildren or whether it is uh, funneling more money to pork barrel projects and taking the dollars that, uh, that, that you earned and giving them and having the government confiscate them. So there's that. And just about any issue uh, can be framed in these different ways. And that's what we call spin doctoring. That is uh, finding the most uh, compromising or uh, unsavory way in which an, a, 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 an event or position can be framed and claiming that that's your opponent's position. Um, and then there's also connotation of the a euphemism and dysphemism. The same phenomenon that goes into swearing, namely that words, in addition to having their literal meaning, can evoke an immediate emotional response, is uh, put to effect often in, in uh, political rhetoric, uh, such as, my opponent is a liberal, uh, which you, uh, has the, can have the effect, if skillfully applied, of making certain words, like liberal, basically the equivalent of swear words. Uh, and uh, this is obviously specific to a time and place. You go across the border to Canada, and there's a, there's a liberal party. And uh, people are proud to say, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a liberal. But you can't say that in American politics uh, because of a uh, use of whatever psychological process. And I don't think it's well understood that allows words to gain or lose strong emotional colorings um, and terrorism and um, uh, many other words can uh, kind of suck up uh, emotional colorings together with their literal meaning, and that's part of political rhetoric. Uh, yeah, no, I th I'm, un unfortunately, we're not going to disagree here. So, unfortunately, <laughs> for the entertainment value of the, the audience. I have a cartoon that I had in my, in my book, The Blank Slate, which I think captures this uh, from Ar Arlo and Janice, where Arlo is up one night pacing back and forth, mm -hmm. and he comes, goes to his son, and his son's sitting in front of the TV munching popcorn. He says to his son, why are we here? The boy says, to spread our genes. Mm -hmm. And Arlo <laughs> sits in boy looks up and says, you still here? <laughs> <laughs> I think Arlo's anguish is what, what you're putting your finger on. And, and I, I agree that there's no reason that just because the, un that the universe doesn't have a purpose or our species doesn't have a purpose, it doesn't mean that we as individuals don't have a purpose or can't find meaning. That there are, uh, ultimately, it's a, it does push you to a kind of humanism in looking for value and purpose and morality, not in some unfolding plan of the entire 
uh, planet and, and um, <clears throat> life on Earth, but in our own powers to realize and um, deliberate among ourselves as to what is valuable and meaningful. And one of them is indeed understanding, thanks to the gift of our cognitive faculties, our place in nature, quite literally where we came from, what was the process that brought us into being, and that I think there is... The a, actual process that brought the us into being. The actual it. process, right. yeah, to be, and, and to be, to be, um, to have an, our, our best and most accurate understanding of ourselves, uh, there's an exhilaration in that, that our species is smart enough and, and noble enough to have tried to figure it out and to have succeeded as well as it has. And also, there, there are, to be sure, depressing uh, parts of this picture. It might be nice to, to live forever, to have a soul that uh, survives the death of the body and, and lives eternally. It, it is, I mean, death sucks. I mean, it is kind of depressing to think that it's all of my experiences due to the activity of an organ, which someday will cease to function. Uh, but there's also... Especially kind of, if you work for a newspaper. That's very hard. <laughs> yeah, right. Sooner than, <laughs> yes, some sooner than others. Uh, but there's also a, a kind of uh, maturity in understanding that that is our, our state, that we're not fooling ourselves with childish stories, and that within the constraints that we have every reason to believe are there, living the most meaningful life we can, including the realization that there are things that are, are beyond us. I mean, you, you talk about uh, deep time, but in a way that's, I think, emblematic of an entire um, world that is larger than any of us, time extended unimaginably before us and will after us, but also there are worlds of numbers and logic. Uh, there are space itself. Space yeah. itself, the physical process that uh, allowed the universe to unfold from the Big Bang, the laws of social organization and morality that might be consequences of uh, realizing that other people have minds as we do. It's certainly not that you could, you're only sitting in front of a TV munching popcorn if you don't believe that there is a transcendent purpose to the unfolding of life. We can figure out an awful lot of stuff, and an awful lot of it is bigger than any of us. When we think about the U.S. system of, gov of government and justice, the U.S. Uh, Constitution, Christianity provided a lot of the resources for that. So I think there are things to be critical of and for Christians to apologize for, but I think it's a mistake to suggest that Christianity is all this bad stuff and religion is always this bad stuff and we need secular humanism to save the day. I, I, I'm not sure th how strong that case is in the case of the, uh, the Constitution, although you know, I'm, 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 I'm not the, the legal scholar, but uh, the, the framers of the Constitution were largely deists who had a very airy-fairy notion of, of God, if, if at all, and were inspired by the um, thinkers of the European Enlightenment, Enlightenment, many of whom were deists, atheists, or agnostics. Jesus is not mentioned in the, con the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence. Uh, the only mention that's at all, even in the leaning toward religion, is endowed by their creator. Uh, but uh, even that was just a way of, of uh, getting the notion of uh, equal rights on uh, paper. Um, I, I think it would be a stretch to call, the, to call liberal democracy a uh, product of, uh, of Christianity, either historically or intellectually. And there also, I mean, the Crusades wasn't the end of it. There was also, of course, the, the uh, Inquisition and the European Wars of Religion, where there was just tremendous bloodshed. Uh, over what was the, the best interpretation of Christianity. There were you know, the massacres and genocides and uh, burnings at the stake. And, uh, so it was self-correcting in the sense that several hundred years later, uh, things, things have calmed down. You don't have Christians and, uh, pro I mean, uh, sorry, Protestants and Catholics killing each other, at least you know, now that the troubles in Ireland are, are down. And, but uh, uh, you know, I would say it's a little too benign uh, an interpretation of the self-correcting nature that would take that many centuries and with the European wars of religion in between. Um, Jesus' teachings, and wondering, do you see them as radical as it relates to altruism and peace? Do you see them well, as actual yeah. teachings? Or, I mean, because there's a way to read the Old Testament, and then there's a way to read the Crusades. But like his teachings themselves, do you see them as radical in their... I mean, a lot of the teachings are, you've got to accept me. Uh, you know, I, I come to you with a sword, uh, and uh, he that values his own father and 
son and brother and sister more than, than he values me, is not worthy of me. There's a lot of stuff there that's really more um, you know, gather around me, accept me as, uh, as, as uh, uh, the, the Messiah. There isn't the message that whatever you do, make people as better, as, as well off as possible, increase life, uh, happiness, health. It's uh, a lot of it is except me. And that, I think, historically was pernicious because if you have, there's two sets of values, they can overlap, uh, but they don't always overlap. And uh, acting so as to maximize human flourishing, life, health, happiness, accepting that Jesus died on a cross for your sins, they're not the same value. Uh, and if they, if people want to uh, foster both, okay, although then what do you do with the people uh, like my people, like the Jews, who don't accept Jesus? Well, I mean, we know what the answer was, it wasn't so pretty. Um, what do you do with the rest of the world that uh, is not going to accept uh, uh, Jesus? Are they condemned to eternal torture? Uh, do you write them off? Do you try to convert them all? Um, so the part of the New Testament that is, uh, accept me 